Sally T. McKay is a professional speech coach and trainer with 20 years of experience in public relations, personal coaching, and customer service training. An award-winning graduate of the University of South Carolina College of Journalism and Mass Communications and the Buckley School of Public Speaking, Sally has coached CEOs, customer service representatives, government officials, bankers, and other professionals in the areas of public speaking, understanding audiences and customers, and working with the media. Sally's other professional experience includes being director of the University of South Carolina's Bicentennial Celebration in 2001, account executive at the former Chernoff Silver Agency, and vice president of communications for the South Carolina Bankers Association. Sally was governor of Palmetto Girls State in 1987 and attended Girls Nation. She is a former counselor and staff member of both programs. Sally and her husband, Walker, have two boys, Walker and Mitchell. Please join me in welcoming Mrs. McKay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, girls. Welcome to Girls State. I feel like I have to say that. Yeah, hey, nice to see you out there. Wow, and you've been here for a few hours, a couple hours? Yeah, yeah. figuring it out sitting with um, 629 of your newest great friends um, from all over the state and maybe wondering what this is all going to be about, why you showed up anyway, and uh, what in the world is getting ready to happen this week. Well, what is getting ready to happen this week is up to you. You'll have some tour guides along the way, obviously, but what happens and what you get out of this is up to you. So I hope you put into it exactly what you want to and reap the rewards from being here and from getting to know young women from all over the state. I still have a good friend that I met here in 1987. And um, so yeah, it, that's a long time ago, 1987, wow. So every year I get to come, this is a, a real treat for me to get to come over here and spend some time with you on the first Sunday of Palmetto Girls State. But before I get into the, um, the depth and the breadth of what I want to talk with you about, and actually you're going to be doing some talking back to me because I'm about to uh, take the handheld and come down to your zip code. But before I do, I'm curious, where are the Richland Northeast girls? Are you in, are you in the house? r &E girls? Any Cavaliers out here? All right. Hey, that's my high school. I just got to give a shout out. Um, how about Heathwood Hall? Where are the Heathwood girls? Are you here? Yeah. yeah, well that's where my children are and that's where I've been working for the last couple of years. So hello, glad to see y'all, um, some sisters, you know, from familiar places. So public speaking, y'all are here, I trust, because you have some kind of experience in leadership, student government, uh, religious affiliation, leadership, something, yes? So raise your hand if you have given some kind of public talk, speech, presentation. Yeah. Okay, sure. So I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but I'm going to not try to preach. Okay, so you all are experienced in being in front of other people. So now let me ask this question. How many of you, be honest, how many of you before you get up in front of an audience, how many of you get some nerves going? Nerves? Yeah, sure, me too. And how about like really deep set nervousness? Anyone in that category? Yeah, be honest. Yeah, 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 yeah. A little shaky, maybe the neck gets a little red. You got that happening for you? That's a really fun thing, you know, especially in the summertime, you can't wear a turtleneck to cover it up. And um, maybe you get sweaty in the palms, that's a real thing, or jittery, all those kind of things. Well, you are in the majority. Those of you who don't have some kind of debilitating nerves, we are actually in the minority in the country, probably in the world. Do you know that? You know that old adage that public speaking is the number one fear of people. I mean, I want you to take a couple of seconds and consider that. I mean, we have so much to be afraid of in this world, don't we? Drones figuring out where you live. Um, people hacking into your accounts, uh, terrorists. There are a lot of things to fear. But no, 
our number one fear is public speaking. And I'm gonna ask you about that when I come down and, and talk to you. I wanna hear about you and what you think about when you are getting ready to make a talk. So I'm gonna give you some basic pointers. And for you, it's just gonna be review. In fact, you could teach this session, basically. But things that I want you to keep in mind, and then I'm gonna be on my soapbox a little bit because now more than ever, now more than ever, we need people to speak out. We need young women and middle-aged women, that's me, to speak out, to be heard, and to have something to say, and to have a real point of view, okay? Now more than ever. And I have to say that it is rare now that people give as much thought to the spoken word as they do the texted word or any other form of technology. Maybe it's social media or maybe it's some kind of inbound marketing. You know what I'm talking about. And so interestingly, this day and time, when you are a standout presenter, and I don't mean just the outer package. It's great to look good and to basically sound good and to be in control and calm. But I mean, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? What are you saying? And why should I, as a member potentially of your audience, why should I care? And that's a real question. And so there's, I'm gonna start with that. How many of you really think about when it's time to give a presentation? Like the first thing on your mind, and this week it's more of a speech, not so much presentation. Think of it what you will call it a conversation because that makes people less nervous sometimes. Is the first thing you think about like, oh my God, what am I gonna say? Raise your hand if that's where you are. Like, okay, I gotta think about what I'm gonna say. Well, yeah, duh. You gotta think about your message. So I'm wondering for how many of you, before you get up in front of a group, small or large, do you think first instead, who is my audience? Anyone go there? Yeah. Okay, so after today or after whenever you decide, Let's make the audience your focal point. This time that you spend in front of others, it's about the audience. It's not about me. This is about you. And many speakers, professionals, heads of companies, teachers, people get that confused. That when I give a presentation, business leaders are the worst. I mean, they have, dang it, I've got a presentation here. I've got stuff I gotta say. But if I don't have an audience who's on board with me, why does it even matter? Okay, so that's my first point to you. Get to know who your audience is. And I know you know the basics. You're all, what, rising seniors in high school, and you're all from South Carolina, so you know the basics. But maybe as you dwell a little more in your cities, in your counties, okay, and you start getting deeper into this week, you're gonna learn more about your audience. And that specifically is what should fuel your talk. Does that make sense? All right, so know your message, that's critical. Know your audience even before that. Okay, you willing to practice that this week? Yeah. All right, so let's go back to the message for a moment because uh, you know that does pretty much matter. <laughs> that stuff you're gonna be talking about. And there are some really good speakers who are just good at being in front of people. But they don't always pay very good attention to their message. And smart people like you all could read right through that person. They're all hype, they're all show, and they're not a whole lot of substance. And you'll see some of that this week as you are getting warmed up and trying to figure out what you want to talk about. What is my point of view? And so when you're configuring your message, um, I'm assuming here that you don't use notes. We never were allowed to use notes here at Girl State when we gave speeches. So you're going to organize yourself somehow. And I'm going to hear from you about that in a moment. But I just want to think about this with you. Let's say you're getting up and you're running for uh, mayor. That's probably gonna be your first elections today or tonight. 
and you know you want to be mayor, but you hadn't really figured out for yourself why. Like, why would I want to do this? Because it's what I came here to do? Because my mom wants me to like run for all these, I mean, I don't know. Figure out your why of why you're doing. And then I, I recommend just creating three or four main points. You know the drill. And so let's say you're, uh, you're gonna run for mayor because of three very important things, okay? Leadership, experience, enthusiasm. The big three. What do you think? Sounds pretty good. Leadership, experience, enthusiasm. I like that in a person. You like that in a person? I like that in a person that I'm gonna put some trust in. But so here's the thing, like I'm guessing that most of you have experience and leadership and some kind of enthusiasm. So it's not very differentiating. But if it is compassionate leadership, that's a little bit more nuanced, isn't it? And that's telling your audience something about you. If you have a tempered enthusiasm, you're not rah-rah about everything, but you care deeply about some things. And you have very focused experience. You see, you're starting to design and describe these traits of yours. Well, this is gonna help the audience a bit, yes? And it's gonna help differentiate you. Okay, so you're gonna know what you're gonna say, basically. You will have decided what you think you know about your audience, okay? And then the rest of it is all about the how. We've got the who or to whom, better for grammarians, to whom am I giving this talk? The what, what am I saying? What is my content? And so now let's dig into the how. You wanna do that? Let's do it together, I'm coming down. I'm bringing some stuff with me. Now I'll save that. Test, test. You know what's nice about a microphone is that I don't have to dig so deep. I can be enthusiastic and I can have some energy, but I don't have to be so, so loud and so focused on just carrying my voice way out there. All right, the how. How do you give this talk? So the first thing I want to know, oh, and y'all gonna have to work with me because usually I run up and down the aisles. So I'm gonna get you all to answer a few questions, and I'm gonna call on somebody who raises her hand, and you're gonna give me some answers to this. I want you to think about, what is one trait that you have observed in good speakers? Speakers who really spoke to you for whatever reason. Yes, ma'am, I saw you way back there. Can you stand and dig deep? Tell me who you are, by the way. Humility. Okay, wait, 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 stay there, stay there. Wow, that's a deep one. All right, how have you observed humility in a speaker? Ah, thank you. Did you hear that? Good, good digging deep, by the way. We could all hear you. Somebody who is willing to understand the audience 
and who is not above some other group of people. Yeah, here at Girl State, I mean, I think it's critical that everyone has equal stature. Just because you run for an office or not doesn't make you any less than or more than. That's great. Okay, another trait. Another trait. Yes, ma'am. Right here. Confidence, yes, and you've noticed that in the speakers that speak most to you. Yes, absolutely. You can tell tremendously when a speaker is confident what they're saying, when they project something to the audience, when they talk about something, when they feel they're talking about. Like they really feel like they know what they're talking about. Oh, yes. All right, well, thank you for that. I could not agree more. And by the way, you sounded very confident as you talked about people who are confident, and that's good too. Well, let's go to the flip side of that. When, can you think of a time, I can think of a time recently, when you were a very unfortunate member of an audience and the speaker was lacking in confidence and the speaker was lacking in some of these important, other important traits, whether it's enthusiasm, but the confidence piece is the worst. Okay, When's, have you sat in a talk like that and they're, they're a little bit scared and they don't really talk as loud as they probably should? And um, so I'm a, I know that human nature is usually, um, we wanna help each other. So sometimes when speakers stand up and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really nervous, so bear with me. Have you, have you heard those people? You know, and I know I'm, I'm a nice person and I'd be like, oh no, you're gonna be okay. But what I'm really thinking is, dang you, you're supposed to be taking care of me. I'm your audience. I don't want to take care of you. I'm sitting in your audience. You take care of me. And that's part of being a good speaker, and that's part of the humility, and that's part of knowing your audience. So confidence is key, okay? All right, so somebody tell me, how do you develop this kind of confidence even in the face of nerves? How do you do it? Like, oh, wow, way back there. I mean, can you speak to me? Stand, yes. Wow, that's great. So that's like the old, it could not get worse mentality. It, it's already been worse, so it can only get better. That's interesting. Okay, I like that actually. Someone else, someone else. How do you deal with this? Okay, right here. Yeah. Aha, uh -huh. very good. When you are a good leader and a good speaker, you are also a good follower and a good listener. The best speakers I know are the most, are the best listeners I know. They go hand in hand. Okay, that's exactly right. Now let me ask you an important question about this confidence thing. To be a confident and competent leader, do you have to have all the answers? No. Does anyone think you do? I mean, that's a, that's a fair thought. Because there's a difference in knowing it all and being confident that you can handle whatever comes your way. And let's face it, y'all, I mean, when I was your age and younger, you know, born in 70, grew up in a time where, I mean, can you imagine no internet? Can you imagine it? Can you imagine that? I mean, even I, like, I Google everything I want to Google. There's no need not to know something, you just know it. You Google it, Google's a verb. We do it all day long, okay? So here's the thing, knowledge, does not differentiate you or me. Because guess what? The whole world can get knowledge now. When I was growing up, we had encyclopedias. We had all encyclopedias, the whole set. And that's what we used. We needed to find something out about another country. We just had to open that encyclopedia and hope it was there. Or go to the library and hope we could find a magazine article. So knowledge doesn't make you better or me. We can't hide behind that. It's what you do with the knowledge you find. It's how you use it compassionately, wisely, and in a way that will speak to your audience, okay? All right, one more trait of, of great speakers. Sure, right here. Oh, 
okay, yes, you rem she said, you remember that your message is so important that you can get over your nerves because you really want the audience to hear it. Yes, could we maybe define that as passion? Like you are so passionate about your message. Okay, so he, that is so good. And you have to know what you're gonna say. There's the what. And I had better be really passionate about my topic. And that will win every time. Even if it's sitting in the audience, even if I really don't care much about the topic, I've been in those too. I've got these luncheons, you know, like rubber chicken luncheons, and they've got a guest speaker and whatever, and I don't really like his topic and whatever, but maybe he is just such a good, just passionate, but not over the top, there's a line. And I'm moved by it in some way. So I want you to develop that passion. If you only say what you think your audience wants to hear, a la the political world we live in, if you only say what you think your audience wants to hear, but you're not really that passionate about yourself, it's going to show through. And if you're really nervous, passion trumps nerves every time. Every time. It's like rock, paper, scissors. They still play that anymore? Yeah, okay, good, good. Didn't want to be anachronistic or something. Okay, so let me hear, um, uh, I'm looking for another quality of speakers. Um, yeah, okay, sure. We are on the same wavelength, my friend, right there, because that's where I was going with speed. And so she said that eloquence is important because people have to be able to understand what you're saying. And if you're going too fast, who talks fast? Anyone else talk fast? Who talks faster when you're nervous? Boy, I have a 12-year-old son. Oh, he is a bad liar. And that's good for him but he starts talking. He's a verbal processor just like me, and that verbal processor just starts going fast because he is nervous. And that happens to most of us. It's all about the nervous system. Things start flowing in the body, and you start talking really fast. So that may be your biggest challenge this week. I have to discipline myself. There's so much I want to say, right, that I think if I could just say faster, I'll get it all out there. Well, no. You calm it down. How in the world can you work on a slower delivery? How? What's one way? Uh, sure, right here in the front. You want the mic? Now's your, now's your mic. Do it. Um, I'm Emily Ann, and I think if you take pauses, like if you just take breaks, maybe breathe, mm. and that will help you slow down. Yes, it will. Thank you. Emily Ann? Yeah. Uh, the, let me start with the breath, because that is... Breathing is critical, I mean, to live, but also to slow things down. So before I drove over here, I was in a two-hour yoga practice. I'm a big believer in yoga and yoga practice and breathing and all of that. And nothing calms me down and brings me more to my center than the breath. And the tr same thing would be true for you. So if you can develop a practice of even just 10 really good slow breaths in and out full breaths in and out it will warm the body in a good way and calm the nervous system and you'll be surprised what that can do for your rate of speech okay so not too fast not too slow either I, rarely do i meet people who talk too slow although this is the south and it is hot and people do tend to talk a little slower here, but not when they're up in front of people. So I want you to keep all of these things in mind, how you do it, what you say, to whom, of course, how am I do it? What, what about eye contact, yes? Do you think about eye contact when you talk? Give me a, hand, a show of hands there. Yeah. So there's no way I can look every one of you in the eyes today, but I'm doing my darndest to find as many eyeballs as I can find and try to connect. Even if I'm just shooting my eyes way back into the back, like I'm looking at someone right now, okay? And so for you to be willing to do that kind of connection, of course, because remember, th is this about you? Nope. Never again is a speech about you. That's good news for people who are nervous. It's bad news for people who thought it was about them, right? Okay, I get both sides of that. This is about how you are connecting to an audience. And we are, and let me get back on my soapbox for a minute, we are the most 
technologically connected society that has ever existed, but I don't think we're that connected at all. We do the petty stuff, the texts, all of that, but are we really connecting with human beings? Maybe, but use your opportunity to be in front of people. Use that opportunity to make a connection. Okay, connect with your own message, with your own passion, and then shine that out. Shine out the light that is in you. Shine that out to your audience. And if you just do that, then you don't have to think about eye contact, and you don't have to think about enthusiasm or confidence, because those things will be there. They'll be there from the inside out. These are not things you put on like clothes, okay? So I hope this week you all will truly just take advantage of the opportunities you have. Think first about your audience. You'll know more about your audience every day here. Develop your message carefully, thoughtfully. Be aware that someone in the room is gonna disagree with you about something, and that's okay, that's good. But having that real civil discourse, that's such a buzz phrase now, civil discourse. Can we, can we talk about things um, in dialogue versus like t snapping at each other? And being in disagreement is good. But we don't have to lose compassion for others in that. Okay, and I've, I've done it. I've been mean to people before, but they, who didn't agree with me. I'll admit it, I got ideas. So do you. But we can maintain connection. And that's the most that I hope for you this week. I love all the tactician stuff. I love the how you place your feet and how you lift your heart and how you stand well and you smile. Don't forget to smile, by the way. Don't look like you're miserable, even if you are. Okay, try not to look miserable because see, that's not taking care of your audience. I know it's being honest. It's not necessarily taking care of your audience. Think about how fast or slow. Figure out how you're gonna remember what you're gonna say. All those things, but honestly, forget all of that for a moment. Go back to the big picture, and it's the heart picture, and it is connect. Connect. First, you connect to your own passion, then you connect that passion with your audience, okay? So is someone up there? Can you, would you hear me my phone and my glasses? I'm just going to do this from down here, because I've got to, I'm going to end with a little poem. Do y'all have any questions, by the way? Anything you're just dying to say or ask? Wow, is that good? Oh, back there, good. Hi. And you tell me, so I wanna make sure I heard you right. You're planning to go to the University of South Carolina and you wanna be in sports, Mass communications and athletic sports? Like you wanna be like a commentator on ESPN one day? Okay, yeah, cool. Yes, I have advice for you. And, and I would say this advice to every single person in this room, but as it relates to what path you wanna choose. Find every opportunity in your college career and in this next high school year that you have left, find every opportunity for hands-on experience hands-on experience. Ask um, someone at the local, one of the local stations in Columbia, see if you can get in with Rick Henry at WIS, see if you could shadow him, see if you could, you find any and every opportunity for internship, for experience, read as much as you can, watch as much as you can, but get in there and find every opportunity. Yeah, they'll be there, they'll be there. That's a great question and you're already thinking about your passion. Yeah, what else? Anything else? Way back there. Hi. Yeah, okay, great. She's asking, what, do I have a go-to hook? Um, and, and maybe I'll just even add to your question, is it a good idea to have a hook? Yes. Yes, have a hook. And different people hook audiences differently, okay? Some people love to open with some humor, all right? Now, I'm, I got experience in the department of telling jokes when you start a talk and that didn't go well, 
Um, and I will never come clean on that for sure, but I promise you, your joke is going to offend somebody. And mine did. <laughs> it's about 20 years ago. I hadn't lived it down yet. So the hook for me, I'll say this as an audience member, the best hook for me doesn't have to be a specific humor piece or a specific question. A lot of speakers open with a question, you know, or they open dramatically by placing their audience in a scene. You know, they open, they're like, so you're sitting on a boat and you're in the middle of the ocean. And no, you, you know what I'm saying. And so those are interesting hooks, but they better, whatever the hook is, it needs to come across as being authentic to you, something that you would definitely do naturally. For me, the hook that I love to be to use, it's not so much of a hook, but I want instant communication with the audience or connection with the audience. I I'm going to smile pretty early on, and I, I am going to use humor. I mean, I've done it today, and some of you actually laughed, which is good. Um, but my humor is usually... I'll use another word of our society. It's kind of, it's more Seinfeldian, if you know who Seinfeld is. It's more, it's more naming a truth about human beings. Do you know what I mean? Because to me, that's the funniest that there is. I mean, you know, anything that, you, that happens to you and you look at your friend and you say, oh, you can't make this stuff up, that's funny. Anything that you said that about is funny. Okay, so hook, be careful with your hooks. Don't make them gimmicky is my advice, okay? All right, anything else? I love your questions. Those are good questions. Yes, over here. Yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, wait, wait. Okay. okay. It behind you first, and then you. Okay. Huh? My question is, what is the impact You mean the impact that Girl State had on me or the changes in Girl State? So, a couple of things. I'm gonna answer that on two levels because I'm, I'm, I'm still not quite sure exactly what you're looking for there. Um, the program itself has evolved wonderfully. Okay, it was a lot like this when I showed up in 1987 and yet we didn't have that. And we didn't have those screens, hello, that's me up there. And we didn't have a cool, it was not technologically savvy because there was no technology. We, we typed. Um, newsletters on a typewriter while the girl staters were sleeping and then you, somehow you get it every day and it was on Mimi, I don't know, copier or something. So I love how the program has evolved. I also know that some things never change at Girl State. Uh, the singing, <laughs> you get in the drift that you're going to be doing some singing this week. You got that down? So some of you love to sing and some of you hate to sing. Can we just name that? And you're going to be singing. Okay, so some things stay true, and I think the best programs that have been around for a long time, certain things, certain threads stay constant, and they run through the programs, and then others evolve and grow and pulse in and out the way that I think is very, very healthy. As far as the impact on me, the program had an immediate impact on me. Um, I came here as a junior from r &E, and up until that time, I had spent every moment that I was not at school as a dancer. I was in the Columbia City Ballet, dancing was my life. But I was starting to feel a little antsy in it. And being here and realizing what a passion I had for state government, for, um, yes, public speaking, I wouldn't have figured that out very well had it not been for this program. And so that sent me on a whole new course. And I really owe that to this program. So yeah, very grateful, very grateful. Okay, now, the person in front of you. Hi. Boy, oh boy. Oh, that's, the, that's the question of the day. How do you, uh, maybe the, of the century, how do you find the balance between passion, your passion, say, about a particular issue. And man, I got two or three, one in particular, just a real issue that for me is, is just my passion. How do you balance between that and being offensive? Because there's gonna be people 
in your audience or just your friendship circles or your family who disagree with you. And y'all, it can just get ugly. Civil discourse goes right out the window sometimes. Here's how I do it when I am being mindful, which is not always. It is my intention to be mindful. I remember that not everyone agrees with me, okay? That my way or the highway does not work. It works great for me and for many of other people who I enjoy spending time with because we agree and we like to discuss the nuances of these issues that we agree about. But I have family members, close family members, with whom I disagree on several issues, particularly social issues. And I have to remember that I'm not the only, there, my viewpoint is not the only one. And that is the humility that goes back to someone's comment. And that is what keeps you balanced. I, I, I don't want my passion to diminish, but I definitely have to remember that, you know, my dad and I differ on lots of things, okay? And I, I try my best to keep it tight there in the, in the way of understanding that. Yeah, wonderful question. Practice that this week. Oh, yeah, you're gonna have issues in front of you. Okay, one more, do we have time for one more? Uh, well, no one's in charge, so yes, yes we do. Hello. <laughs> Wow. So tell me your name again. Sydney wants to be a teacher. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for that. Because, you know, sometimes we lose our brightest and our most passionate and our most capable. We lose them. We don't get them in the teaching community because it's not, you can't make a lot of money. I mean, there's such an irony that we don't pay teachers like the most money. Think about that for a minute. Because they make it possible, don't they? Right? You wouldn't be here without teachers, nor I. So anyway, that's another soapbox for another time. Um, how do we keep children's attention was her question. Well, that's your hardest audience. Children and really old people can be really difficult sometimes. Okay? So can every other age, by the way. But I have a 9-year-old and a 12-year-old, and they're boys. Boys are infamous for lack of attention. Do you have brothers who resemble that? Yeah. Um, and girls, too, sometimes. But how do you keep their attention? you have to really work on understanding them. Okay, I don't have a silver bullet, um, no real secrets, but I do know that when I try to make every moment a teaching moment with Walker and Mitchell, you know, they're like, I start sounding like the teacher in the Snoopy, you know, wah, 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 wah. they don't hear a word I'm saying. But if I take interest in something they're doing, I ask them about them, they answer and then I can go from there. So yeah, it's all about the audience, but it's a hard audience, yeah. Okay, so that was the one more. I would love to hear more of your questions. Mrs. Belser knows um, how to email me. I'd love to answer your questions and make good use of that technology. I'm gonna close with a poem. I didn't write this poem. Um, I'm old enough to need some glasses. So this is a poem by one of my favorite Marianne Williamson, poets Marianne Williamson. And I read this to the yoga class that I taught yesterday. I read it often. And this, I want you to take any of this that is good for you, this week and any other time. And the poem is called Our Greatest Fear. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. 
And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And so let your light shine this week when you're making speeches or presentations or sitting next to someone at dinner or walking to an assembly with somebody or doing nothing, just sitting with somebody. Figure out your light, keep revealing it, keep uncovering it, it's there. And then share it with each other. Have a wonderful week and I look forward to hearing all about it. Be well. Please stand and sing the second verse of the Girls' State Anthem as our guest is escorted out. <laughs> 